This is Josh Hope with Momaki USA. We're going to take a look at using the jig function inside of RasterLink 6 combined with the data merge function in InDesign to create a variable data workflow that's PDF based and very easy to do. So I'm going to start off with some artwork. It's just vector art and it doesn't have to be a uh, vector. You can use images. This happens to be an EPS, whatever works for you. So I've got a series of these that are all vector EPS files and I've got them saved out exactly the same size and I've got ten, ten of them uh, just numbered PC1 through PC10.EPS. Again, you can use any image format that you want. Just to make things easy, I have these saved on my D drive and I've got them in a folder called VDP Art. So the next thing that we'll need is to create our data source. So in Excel, I've just created a simple spreadsheet. It's saved out as a CSV file, so comma separated values. And I've got two columns here. The first column has a header called P name. And this is just a text name that I came up with, kept it short so I would know what it was. And then under P name, I just have uh, different product names. So different Momaki printer names, the word Momaki, it can be whatever text you want. So the next column is my image path. So it's the drive letter slash the directory slash the file name. So again, the PC1.EPS through PC10.EPS. The header here is at image. And the at image is a specific name that InDesign looks for in that data source to know that it's about to be handed the path to an image. When you create this, if you have a problem typing in the at sign, you may need to put an apostrophe before it so that it will accept it. For example, if I come here and I put in at image and I hit enter, it tells me that the function isn't valid. What we want to do is we just want to put an apostrophe in front of it there. As soon as I click off of it, it accepts it as at image and we're good. So that's what I've done here. So I've got P name with just some text in it. I've got at image with file paths that go directly to those files. Once you have this all set up, it's very important that we don't have any extra information anywhere in the file. If we do, it will show up as a uh, empty cell inside of our CSV file when we go to import it inside of InDesign. So we make sure that we don't have anything other than the column, the column header, the data that we want. So once we've got that all set, we can save it. And if we close, I'm going to save it one more time here. Do I want to replace it? Yes. If you get this message saying, don't worry about it. As soon as I click off of it, it accepts it as at image and we're good. So that's what I've done here. So I've got P name with just some text in it. I've got at image with file paths that go directly to those files. The whole thing has been saved out as a comma delimited file, CSV file, and I've just got it on the desktop in a folder called Poker Chip VDP. All right. So once I've got that and I've got my artwork, then we'll go to InDesign. Inside InDesign, I'm going to make a new file just a new document and I know that my poker chips are sized at one and a half inches by one or they're cir circular one and a half inches but I'm gonna make my document one and a half by one and a half inches uh, for the margins I don't need any so I'm gonna tell it I don't want any margins nothing for the bleed nothing else fancy All right so I've got my document that's an inch and a half by an inch and a half the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and set up my uh, image box. So I'm going to come here to the rectangular frame tool. I'll double click and I'll tell it the size I want is an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And then that box I'm going to set at zero zero. So now I've got it filling up the entire frame. Now I'll open up layers just to make things a little bit easier. I'm going to tell it that this is going to be my image layer don't have to do that it just kind of helps to make things a little bit more organized 
Now I can go ahead and make a text layer as well because I know I'm going to put that text on there. And now I've got both layers. Now that I have my layer set up, I'm going to go ahead and set up the data merge. So I'm going to come to the window menu, I'll come down to utilities, and over to data merge. This opens up the data merge menu and it actually gives me the steps that I need to do here. So choose select data source from the panel menu. That's the first thing. So we'll come up to the panel menu here. We'll select data source. I'm going to browse to that CSV file that I just set up and I can see it here that everything looks like it's formatted well. So I'll hit open. And now it's telling me I've got PNAME and image. So we're off to a good start. So the first thing that we're going to work with is the image. From the data merge window we're going to select image and we'll just drag it and drop it onto our frame here. So we can see that image comes up and what we want to do is just get a quick preview to make sure that the images are coming in correctly. So back in the data merge window I'm going to select preview and I can see my preview come up and I can cycle through the previews to each record to make sure that they're all coming in. So I've got 10 images, I'm all set. I'll go back to the first record. I'm going to lock the image window just so I don't accidentally move anything. And then I'll go to the text layer. And what we'll do for the text layer is we'll grab our type tool and we will draw a box and we'll set this to be center justified. It's a little bit high, but we'll fix that in a minute. And then I'm just going to click P name. So P name, because I had the text frame selected, P name automatically comes in. And we'll do a couple things here. So first, we will highlight the text and let's change this to, let's go to Arial Bold. And we will up the text size just a little bit. And then I think this is a little high, so we're going to come down and get this right in our text box so it aligns with the center of the file. Now my text is still up towards the top, so I'm going to right mouse click it and we'll go to text frame options. And in the text frame options window, under vertical justification alignment, we'll change from top to center and we'll hit OK. Now when I cycle through the records, I should be able to see where that text is going to fall on each one of the different designs. So I can see that my text is updating. Everything looks pretty good. And maybe because of those two lines, we'll uh, nudge this down just slightly. The next thing that we'll do is we'll go ahead and give this just a little bit of color as well. So I can come in. I could change my color to red. And we should be good from there. All right. So once I've got that all set up and I'm happy with the way that it looks, I can go ahead and actually merge this together and create a PDF file. So the way that we do that is in the data merge window go ahead over to the palette options and when I click on it we've got an option here for export to PDF. So I'm going to select that. It's going to ask me which records do I want to merge. I'm going to do all of them so 1 through 10. Um, under options I'm going to make sure that it is that the images are fit images proportionally within the frame. They're going to be centered in the frame. I'm not going to link the images. I'm actually going to embed them uh, and the rest of that looks pretty good. I'm not doing anything with multiple records because I'm doing uh, a single record here. I am going to tell it to generate an overset text report with the document creation, meaning that when it makes the PDF, it's going to double check to make sure that any text that I have that might be too long for this text window, it'll give me alert saying, hey, this is too long. It's not going to fit inside there. Uh, it will also alert me when images are missing. So, so we'll say OK here. And then in the export window for Adobe PDF, I'll stay with the high quality print. If you have a particular preset or a standard, you can pick it here. But I'm just going to leave this as the default, and I'll go ahead and export this. 
Now when I export this, I can put it anywhere I want. So I'm just going to throw it on the desktop right now. We'll call it Poker Chip VDP. Um, we'll call this V1. And I'm just going to throw it onto the desktop. Once it generates that file, it goes through, and this is the check we talked about. No overset text was generated when merging records, so we're all set there. So I'm just going to save this, and I'll minimize it for right now. So now on the desktop, I've got my PDF. There it is. I've got 10 records. We're all set to go. So in Rasterlink, So now we'll take a look at Rasterlink. So inside Rasterlink, I'm set up right now with my UJF 7151 Plus. I'm going to go ahead and open that poker chip PDF that we just set up. So I'm coming to the 7151. We'll say open. And you'll notice that as it comes in, you'll see it reading multiple files. But when it shows up, you only see one icon. When you select that icon and you go to the information uh, screen, you will see that it does say 10 pages here. So it is bringing in a mul the multi-page PDF. We're not seeing the preview of every page at this point, though. What I'm going to do is I'll go to the Quality tab, and I'll just make sure that I've got the settings that I want. This all looks fine. We're going to be printing with the LUS 120 ink set. 600 by 600 will be fine for this. Now what I'll do is I'll come over to the jig print option. And inside of jig print, you can see that even though I have that one preview, I have all 10 files have come in. So what I want to do is I want to build a jig that sets these up correctly for. So what I want to do is I want to build a jig that will space these out evenly so I can do as many of these as I want and fit them up. So what I want to do is I want to build a jig that's set up for these inch and a half by inch and a half poker chips and we'll space them evenly so I can make a jig for it to print later. So what we'll do is in the jig definition tab we'll go ahead and say that this is a jig print. And when I tell it it's a jig print, if I, if I look back at So we'll go ahead and take a look at the jig print function. So when I select jig print, I'll see that all of my images are there, all 10 are there, even though I just see the one image for the preview. And what we want to do is set this up so that we've got each one of these spaced out evenly on the bed so that I can build a jig and that I can do repeatable prints. I'll always know where the chips are and that I can keep feeding it that variable data. So if I tell it now that this is actually a jig print by checking the jig print option up at the top, you'll see that each one of these chips falls into a predefined uh, jig, this card sample jig. So obviously this isn't how we want to space them, so we're going to create our own. The way that we're going to do that is I'm going to highlight card sample here, and I'm going to give it a new name. So we'll say poker chips. And then I'm going to add it by clicking on the green Add a Jig Template button. So now I've got basically the same layout, but with a new name. 
So I'm going to leave the jig size the same. So the jig size is the overall size. So if we're going to cut this out of a board, this would be the size of your board. In this case, I'm going to do a board that's the same size as the bed of the 7151. So I'll leave it as just shy of 28 by 20. For the position, this is how the overall jig print would be relative to that media. So we're going to have it start at 0, 0, so we're set up in that bottom right hand corner. For de-skew, you can actually angle things a little bit if you need to. We don't need to do that here. Material. So material size, this is going to be the size of each item that we're printing on. So in this case, we know that they're 1.5 inches round. So I'm just going to say 1.5 by 1.5. So that gives me this square. And the circle is going to fit inside that square. For the count, I'm going to leave this alone just for a minute. I'm going to first go to interval. And for interval, this is going to be what is the space from the first one to the next one. It isn't just the gap, though. It's from that bottom right corner over. So what we're going to do is we're going to say the interval is the size of the piece plus whatever the gap we want. So if I want a one inch gap, I've got my size is 1.5. So I'll add an inch to that, make it 2.5 and 2.5 for the height as well. So now I've got them evenly spaced one inch apart. So inch and a half for the piece and an inch for the space. Same thing going up, an inch and a half for the piece and an inch for the space. So now I see that I can go a couple more for the width. I could probably do more for the height, but I think 70 is probably enough. Now the first position is going to be each of the material pieces relative to the origin. So in this case, we're off the origin by just a little bit. So we can even that up by saying an inch by an inch. And if I wanted to push it a little bit further, I could. All right. Now, if I take a look at the next bit for layout, this is going to tell me when I put an image in that is smaller than the material, how is it going to fit in? So right now, just as we saw before with the poker chips, when it was first in that card layout, they were in the bottom right-hand corner because the registration was here. To see that, if I go to so what we'll do is we're going to set this on the center. It shouldn't really matter for this because we're putting inch and a half circles inside of an inch and a half square, so it should fit just fine. But if we had something smaller or we, we made the opening larger, then this would just keep it centered inside that opening. The last option that we have is for adjustment. So if I had a particular uh, item that I wanted, so material 7, let's say for some reason I wanted to skip that one, I can turn that on and it won't do, it won't actually print that one. So I can skip various ones. I can also change the positioning if I want on just single items. So if for some reason there was a problem in the way that the jig was manufactured and a particular piece was slightly off center, I could actually pick that one and give it a slight correction if I wanted to. So let's say I wanted to move it over by a quarter of an inch. I can do that. So we don't need to do that on any of these. They should be just fine. So we'll just reset there. All right, so we've got our jig all set up. So now if we take a look at our jig layout, all of my pieces have all fallen in place and I'm good to go. One thing to note here is that when you are sending a multi-page PDF, you don't have the option to come in and increase copies here. You would need to either print multiples of them, or you would need to increase the quantity inside of the PDF when you generate it. But we can see we've got them all stepped up. We're all set to go. And at this point, all we would really need to do is to either just hit rip or execute jobs here, or I can come to the execution window and then do rip and print here. Now there's another way that we can do this that will actually speed up this workflow quite a bit and that's by using hot folders. Is go back to jig print and inside of jig print 
we're going to take a look at our favorite tab here. And with the favorite tab, we're going to add a new favorite and we'll call this uh, PC Hot In. So we'll add this as a favorite. And when I do that, you'll see that PC Hot In still has a jig name of card sample, even though we want it to have poker chips. So what we can do is we come back to the favorite tab and this icon is update favorite. So when we click this it will take this information it will send it to that favorite and you can see now that the jig name is set up to poker chips. To actually create the hot folder we'll use this button hot folder creation. It'll come up and it'll be empty. You can't actually type in this. What you want to do is just hit create it will create a folder inside of the MIJ suite directory inside of the folder called hot and it's called PC hot in just because that's what we named it here. So it tells me that the hot folder has been created and we're all set. So we'll hit close there and we'll come back to our main properties window here and I'm going to delete this job. What we'll do is we're going to come back to InDesign and this time we're going to create the same PDF file but we're going to have it go straight to that hot folder or we can take advantage of one of the features of Rasterlink by coming into swatches we'll say that we want a new color swatch and here let's say that it's a spot color and we'll pick Pantone solid coated so let's make this uh, 186. So under swatches now, my color, my type is now Pantone 186. As I go through, everybody's using that same color, and we should be good. So now that that's set, I can go ahead back to my palette options, say export to PDF. Again, all records, single record. We're going to do our overset text. We'll alert if images are missing. Nothing else under the options. We're going to not link the images and we'll center these in the frame and we'll fit images proportionally. And we will go back out to our Adobe PDF preset, the high quality print. We'll export. And this time we will go to the C drive, MIJ suite we will do our hot folder to PC hot in and we'll do this one as VDP 186 it's generating our PDFs we get the AOK -okay there and now when I come back to raster link I'll see that my files coming in and because I'm using the latest version of Rasterlink 6, which is version 5.2.1 currently, I can go under Tool and Color Collection. The Pantone Plus Solid and Solid Uncoded libraries are now included. So that Pantone 186 is giving me the lab value to give me the best color match that I can get. If I come to my color replacement, I'll see Pantone 186 is listed here. It's got my LAB value and currently it says that the color difference is uncalculated. What we're going to do is we'll come down to the Delta E tool. We'll click on that. It will calculate the color difference so in this case we're less than a Delta E of 3 away which is good. And we've got the closest match that we can and we'll actually gives me the CMYK value for what it's going to actually output. Now the reason that this works is because I'm using the latest version 3.5 profile. So if you're using an earlier profile, check and see if there's a version 3.5 profile available. And that will enable you to calculate that color difference. So I've got that all set. I can cycle through the different pages. That same Pantone color is used on every page because I set it up in the text itself. So we'll come to our jig print function. Again, it knows that we're using the poker chip jig. All I have to do is select that jig print option to turn it on. And once again, 
we're ready to rip an output.